Coming up on this Tuesday edition of Daybreak, Korea will dispatch a small advanced team of officials to Sierra Leone and Liberia in the coming weeks to support international efforts to fight the deadly Ebola virus. The International Telecommunications Union opens the world's largest ICT conference in Korea's southern city of Busan. President Park Geun-hye says Korea will help give the developing world better access to ICT. Plus, pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong refuse to budge after the High Court orders them to leave their main demonstration sites. Crunch talks between the government and student protest leaders are set for today. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Tuesday, October 21st here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. Our top story this morning, Korea has pledged to join the international fight against the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone and Liberia. Officials say volunteer medical workers will be sent after a small advance team assesses the situation in the West African countries. Uh, Shin Semin starts us off. A support team of six to seven Koreans will be sent to two West African nations in early November as part of global efforts to stop the spread of Ebola. The ministries of foreign affairs, health and defense said in a briefing Monday that they will send an advanced team of people from the three government agencies to review safety plans for dispatching future support teams. The government is still reviewing which countries they will be sent to, but Sierra Leone and Liberia are said to be the most likely destinations. They also add that the safety of the medics will be the highest priority and that consultations with countries that have already sent support teams such as the U.S., U.K. and Germany were held. In addition to the manpower, Korea has also pledged 15 million U.S. dollars in the global fight against Ebola. The worldwide death toll in the Ebola outbreak has surpassed 4,500, yet there are some positive developments. A Spanish nurse who was the first person to contract Ebola outside of West Africa has tested negative for the virus and is now confirmed free of the disease. And in the U.S., 48 people who came into contact with an Ebola patient in Texas have been taken off the Ebola watch list after showing no signs of the virus. Shin Semin, Arirang News. And actually, there's been some more positive developments in this uh, outbreak we're seeing in uh, West Africa because Nigeria has been declared officially free of Ebola after six weeks without any new cases. The World Health Organization made its announcement on Monday in Abuja, easing fears the virus might have spread to one of Africa's most densely populated countries. The head of the WHO had said a couple of days ago that the appearance of Ebola in a city the size of Lagos would have been the worst, worst nightmare scenario. Officials say the spectacular success shows Ebola can be contained, but they stress the war will only be over when the rest of West Africa is declared Ebola-free. Nigerian doctors were credited for quickly identifying a Liberian-American diplomat who came to Nigeria as having Ebola and placing him in quarantine along with scores more that had come into contact with him. Now, in other news, the highest decision-making body for communications technologies, namely the uh, International Telecommunications Union Conference, begins its second day soon in the southern Korean city of Busan. And as our Song ji -son reports, officials there are aiming to narrow the information gap and bridge the digital divide. Connect 2020 is Division 40 ITU heading into this year's conference. It's a vision that highlights the role of information and communication technologies as a key enabler for social, economic and environmentally sustainable growth and development. The ITU is UN's oldest international organization 
and started out setting standards for telegraph services. Today, it embraces issues ranging from cybersecurity and climate change to expanding internet access for the less privileged. ICTs are, in short, among the keys to achieving sustainable development. As we shape a new development agenda and strive for a new agreement on climate change, let us continue to work together to harness the power of technology to create an accessible and sustainable future for all. As the host of this year's Planned Potentiary and one of the world's leading ICT countries, Korea hopes to contribute to helping other countries achieve sustainable growth by sharing its experience. We wish to come up with solutions at an ITU level that include everyone, especially by improving infrastructure in developing countries. Above all, it is crucial to share our ICT policy experience for shared growth and mutual understanding. The first plenary session followed on Monday, with Korea chairing the meeting as host. Equal access to the Internet and sustainable growth were once again stressed as this year's keywords. To that end, this year's playing potential will also serve as an open venue to build ties outside scheduled events. From this Monday, bilateral and multilateral talks seeking cooperation in the ICT sector will be held throughout the three-week conference between some 3,000 delegates from the 193 member countries. Song Jisun, Arirang News, Busan. Now, also present at the opening day of the global conference was President Park and Hay, and the Korean leader said the world should show better, uh, provide rather better ICT access to the marginalized in the world and boost security against cyber threats. Our Choi Yusun reports. In an age of superconnectivity, telecommunications and new ICT-based industries are continuously changing the ways in which we live. Addressing this year's International Telecommunication Union Conference in Korea's southeastern city of Busan, President Park Geun-hye said the rapidly developing environment poses new challenges to the world. The Korean president first referred to a widening information and communications gap between countries and regions, saying only 3 out of 10 people have Internet access in the developing world, compared to nearly 8 out of 10 in advanced nations. President Bak then talked about the need to bolster the response system against cyber threats and to systematically ensure the safety of new convergence industries and services. The Korean leader used the opportunity to promote her government's efforts to start a creative economy that converges IT with other sectors to innovate, spur growth and create new jobs. 저는 이러한 초고속 네트워크 기반 위에서 우리 경제의 패러다임을 추격형에서 선도형으로 전환하기 위한 창조 경제 전략을 추진하고 있습니다. Endorsing the ITU vision of ICT growth, inclusiveness, sustainability and innovation, President Bak vowed Korea will do its part by sharing its own know-how with the marginalized in society and developing countries. Now, North Korea says it will continue to patrol the heavily fortified inter Korean border and warned of retaliation should Seoul carry on with what it called provocations. Seoul's defense ministry said the North sent the message through a military hotline on Monday condemning warning broadcasts and shots fired by South Korean soldiers a day earlier. The two Koreas briefly exchanged fire across uh, the border near Paju on Sunday after roughly 10 North Korean soldiers were spotted approaching the military demarcation line. South Korea's defense ministry says the shots were a reasonable response given that uh, warnings were issued before shots were fired. Seoul also expressed disappointment that Pyongyang was placing responsibility on the South and urged the North to stop its provocations. South Korea and the United States will hold a joint foreign and defense ministers meeting this week. Seoul's foreign ministry says the so-called 2 plus 2 talks will be held in Washington 
on Thursday local time. South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon byung se and Defence Minister Han ming gu will attend the meeting along with U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and U.S. Secretary of Defence Chuck Hagel. The two allies are expected to cover a wide range of issues, including North Korea's nuclear program and measures to strengthen their already strong bilateral ties. Prior to this, they will hold their annual security consultative meeting and will likely discuss the timing of the transfer of wartime operational control from Washington to Seoul. Now, in domestic politics, representatives from Korea's ruling and opposition party are scheduled to meet later on this Tuesday to discuss the pending Seoul Ho ferry bill and two other bills related to April's tragic uh, sinking. Ruling Seonri Party floor leader Lee Wang Gu will meet with his new Politics Alliance for Democracy counterpart, U Yun Gun, uh, to discuss in detail the Seoul Ho ferry bill which lawmakers ideally want passed by the end of this month. It's been uh, in deadlock for many months now. They will also discuss the 2015 budget inspection schedule and the National Assembly's plenary session set for next week. Both parties will also begin discussing the so-called Government Organisation Act revision from this Tuesday. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Now in economic news, some of the key industries that have kept the Korean economy moving forward, even in, in its uh, toughest times, are steadily losing their competitive Edge. This is a big worry and it's raising questions about how Korea can change its economic structure to ensure sustainable growth in the future. Our Kim ji reports. Korean firms that apply their trade in the industrial sector are calling for more deregulation to improve business conditions. To achieve that, the Korea Chamber of Commerce and Industry submitted a proposal to the government on Monday. The Korean economy is currently stagnant and is in need of structural reforms through deregulation. There is a decline in demand due to the maturity of the market, while cheaper goods are being produced in neighboring countries like China and Japan. The calls are perhaps loudest from those involved in the mobile phone shipbuilding and automobile sectors. They have positioned themselves as three of the so-called pillars of the Korean economy, but are now seeing their dominance diminish as the rates of increase in sales and operating profits are on a sharp decline. In a survey of 176 local companies, the rate of increase in sales among smartphone companies show a steep decline recording a more than a 9% drop in the first half of this year. The shipbuilding industry finds itself in a similar position. Some like Hyundai Heavy Industries and Samsung Heavy Industries even recorded operating losses in the first six months of the year. Of the three, the auto sector appears to be faring the best, but sales are starting to sputter as the rate of increase in sales came to 1.5% in the first half of this year. The Park Geun-hye administration has been calling for deregulatory moves in the industrial sector, but its efforts are being stifled by the rising number of regulations from municipal governments and passive behaviors of civil servants when granting approval for business licensing. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. Now, in line with the government's push to uh, encourage more active foreign investment, Korea's Prime Minister has pledged to improve business conditions so that foreign companies and local firms can uh, grow together. Jong Hong Won's comments came during a meeting in Seoul with 26 heads of foreign firms, including Mercedes Benz and Intel. The Prime Minister said foreign firms are one of the major pillars of the Korean economy as they contribute to 20% of the country's total exports and 6% of total employment. The latest iPhones, the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus, will soon hit the shelves here in Korea. But one firm here wants to block their sale. A Korean venture company has filed for an injunction 
that would ban sales of iPhone products here in Korea. Mobile messaging company Infozone claims that Apple's iMessage function infringes on its uh, patent. Apple has included the feature which allows users to send free text messages to one another on its iPhones and iPads since 2011. Infozone says it notified Apple Korea about the infringement in May, but it received no response. The judgment on the injunction could take up to three months. Now in health news, the World Health Organization is warning that worldwide cancer cases are growing at an alarming rate and urgent action is needed to prevent a crisis. The WHO says healthy behaviors could prevent about half of cancer deaths, so it's released a list of guidelines that should lower the risk of cancer by half. Our Connie Kim reports. The World Health Organization has rolled out a dozen health tips to help reduce the risk of cancer by half. Experts at the WHO's International Agency for Research on Cancer say the recommendations allow people to change their behavior on an individual level. At the top of the list, do not smoke. Do not use any form of tobacco. Have a smoke-free home and workplace. Smoking is a main culprit that kills 6 million people annually and an additional 600,000 from secondhand smoke. The harmful habit is also blamed as the biggest cause of premature death from chronic conditions such as heart disease, stroke and high blood pressure. New tips on the list urge people to look for potential exposure to radiation at home and to actively reduce high radon levels. Bowel, breast and cervical cancer screening tests were also suggested. For females in particular, it recommended breastfeeding, limiting the use of hormone replacement therapy and HPV vaccinations for girls. The 12-point code also stressed the importance of avoiding alcohol, excessive sun exposure, and maintaining a healthy diet. The WHO's specialized cancer agency says it hopes the new code will help individuals to take concrete action for themselves, friends and family, in order to significantly cut down the risks of developing cancer. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Well, now it's time for a look through the international headlines we're following uh, at this hour. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim, standing by the News Centre. Good morning, Eunice. And good morning to you, Mark. An injunction handed down by Hong Kong's High Court is receiving mixed responses among pro-democracy demonstrators being ordered to clear out. The orders affected roads in the districts of Mong Kok and Admiralty, where the central protest site is located. The injunctions were awarded last night to two taxi associations, a bus company, and an investment investment company, all who had argued the sit-ins had lasted too long and was proving to be a public nuisance. The Hong Kong Federation of Students said it respected the court's, quote, reasonable decision, while the group Scholarism said they'd leave it up to individuals to decide for themselves whether or not to stay. This as expectations of a breakthrough were low ahead of a dialogue that will launch today between protest leaders and government leaders to end the weeks-long sit-ins that have blocked traffic around the territory. Its embattled leader CY Lung also last night said the universal suffrage that the demonstrators have been calling for was unacceptable in part because it risked populism driven by the voices of poor residents. Joko Widodo has been sworn in as Indonesia's seventh president, ushering in a new chapter for the world's third largest democracy. The 53-year-old took the oath on Monday in Jakarta in front of hundreds of members of parliament, as well as top foreign delegations, including U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott. Widodo had won a narrow victory in July's election, representing the country's first leader, not from the political or military elite, 
but rather the slums of Java. In his inaugural speech, the former furniture salesman turned Jakarta governor said it was time to realize an Indonesia that has political sovereignty, economic independence, and cultural character. For all the optimism surrounding his inauguration, political watchers say enormous challenges await Widodo in his five-year term, including fierce opposition in parliament against his economic and political reform drive. And Washington is under fire after a report found that the U.S. government had paid out millions of dollars in Social Security to dozens of suspected Nazi war criminals forced out of the country. A senior House Democrat is demanding an investigation after the Associated Press reported that a legal loophole had released the payments, some which continue using taxpayer money. The U.S. Justice Department said benefits are paid to those who renounce their U.S. citizenship and leave voluntarily. But Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney argues that using public resources to support outlaws for several years simply made little sense. And wrapping in the UK, Prince William and his wife Kate Mil Middleton have announced that they are expecting their second child April of next year, just in time for their fourth wedding anniversary. The two were married April 29th in 2011. Kensington Palace also announced that the Duchess of Cambridge was getting better after a severe bout of morning sickness that had forced her to cancel several engagements. So far, though, no word yet on the gender of Prince George's younger sibling. And a good Tuesday morning to you all as we kick things off in the LPGA where South Korea got the good news on Monday that they'll host the 2018 LPGA International Crown. Now the biennial international competition which kicked off for the first time this year will have Korea as the first nation outside of the U.S. to host the International Crown. Mike Wan, the commissioner of the LPGA Tour, stated that the nation was an easy choice to host the event considering their long support of the LPGA. Meanwhile, Spain won the inaugural international crown earlier this year, with Korea finishing in third place. And shifting over to the 2014 Incheon Asian Paralympics Games. Now, South Korea dominated the bowling competitions at the Asian Games, but seems like it's the same case over in the Asian Paralympic Games as well. Now, after winning four gold medals in bowling on the first day, Korea adds three more gold medals in the two-person competitions on Monday. So far, with 7 out of 12 bowling competitions being played, Korea has won all the gold medals as they surpassed their previous goal of winning 5 gold medals in the sport. And now moving over to Game 2 of the first round of the KBO playoffs between the LG Twins and the NC Dinos as the LG Twins have a 1-0 series lead after their big win on Sunday. But unfortunately for the fans, the game was postponed due to rain on Monday and will be made up later today. And now with that stand in baseball, but over to Japan, where former Samsung Lions closer Oh Sung Hwan is making a trip to the Japan series in his first year in Japan with the Hanshin Tigers as he awaits Ide Ho of the Softbank Hawks to advance as well. Now in the decisive Game 7 of the series between the Softbank Hawks and the Nippon Ham Fighters on Monday, Ide Ho goes 2 for 3 with an RBI double in the 8th inning, helping Softbank win the game 4-1 and advances to the Japan series. And now with the Hanshin Tigers and the SoftBank Hawks squaring off for the championship, Korean fans await as they hope to see the battle between Lee Dae Ho and Oh Sung Hwan. And now finishing things off in the NFL, Peyton Manning, who went into his Sunday night game against the San Francisco 49ers, two touchdowns short of the career touchdown record, shattered it with ease. With Brett Favre's record of 508 touchdowns in arm's reach, the future Hall of Fame quarterback throws Four touchdowns against the 49ers in the 42-17 victory to set a new record of 510 touchdowns. Now, with the 509th touchdown came in the second uh, in the second quarter when Peyton Manning connected with Demarius Thomas on an eight-yard strike. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day, and see you guys again for your sports needs.
Good morning. Well, today's weather should be pretty much repeat of yesterday. It's another rainy day. Central parts and upper regions are receiving heavy showers this morning, and about 5 to 20 millimeters of precipitation is in store for Seoul, where some parts in the southern areas could see up to 120 millimeters. And afternoon highs will be similar to yesterday. There will be only about 2 to 3 degrees of temperature gap between lows and highs. So let's take a closer look at today's temperatures. Now the low in Seoul kicked off at 15, then the daytime highs will only make it to 16 this afternoon, while Gwangju and Busan will top out at 21 later on. Now for other regions, Jeju Island and Daejeon will see highs of 24 and 17, while Dokdo peaks at 16. Well, that's all I have for you at this hour. Hope you have a wonderful start to the day. Thank you very much, John, for the weather there. And that's going to do it from us for now. Korea Today is coming up in about 30 minutes' time. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.